For criminal media's policy, I'm Tabi Shomulikai. Mkonto is a special operations compartment, Marion Spark, joins me to unpack her memoir titled Guilty and Proud, an MK soldier's memoir of exile, prison and freedom. Your book, Guilty and Proud, is the gripping tale of a woman who defied stereotypes and at great personal cost, including lengthy imprisonment, stood up for her own belief. So talk to us more about your early life and how you started questioning white privilege and apartheid South Africa. Um, yes, I was brought up in what I can only describe as a very ordinary middle-class, English-speaking, white South African family and community in the Eastern Cape. And the, my, my family wasn't political at all, so there wasn't much politics that was discussed at home. And, yeah, you know, I went to a white school, or I went to the beach, there were only white people there, swimming pools for white people, everything was for white people. The only black people that I effectively came into contact with were those that worked in um, my father's various businesses um, that you saw in the shops or the streets or you know, a gardener or someone who worked in your home. And um, it, that was, all seemed very ordinary and as it should be. We weren't really, none of us were really brought up to question any of that reality. However, in my matric year, we had an Afrikaans teacher, a, a man called Jack Fisser, um, a remarkable man. I mean, he and I bonded quite quickly, and it wasn't really about politics, but it was more about literature. And he introduced me to writers like Ingrid Jonker, Andre Brink, and the discussions I used to have with him was about the writing about Afrikaans literature and the language. It wasn't really about politics at all. I only later came to know the political significance, of course, of a group like the Sestachers. I matriculated in 1976, mm -hmm. and I've never forgotten the 16th of June. We were in the Afrikaans class. Jack Fisser walked in, and he stood in the front of the class, and he just looked at us in silence for a few minutes and didn't say anything. We were all quite puzzled, and we didn't quite know what was going on. And then he... He seemed very angry, and then he suddenly just said to us, do any of you know what's happening in Soweto? And we all just looked at him blankly, because mm -hmm. I don't think many of us from the Eastern Cape even knew where Soweto was. And nobody replied, obviously, and he looked back at us in silence again for a few minutes, and then said, they're shooting children in the street. And he walked out of the classroom and didn't come back for the rest of the lesson. And I suppose it was at that point that I started questioning because obviously you know, I went home and wanted to find out what was happening in Soweto. Um, but it was really only when I got to Rhodes University, um, that would be my first year was in 1977, which is the year of course in which they killed Steve Beaker. And being in Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape, it was a huge issue at university. And um, it was again, I was studying politics and journalism at Rhodes, but it was really the reaction of most of my fellow white students of, at Rhodes. There were only a handful of black students at mm. Rhodes at that time, about 10 if I remember correctly. About three of them were in the journalism class. But um, yeah, most of the white students were actually, I remember I walked into a conversation when I returned to university residence on the day the news of Biko's death was published by the Daily Dispatch. And um, most people didn't know who Biko was or what he stood for. They were just simply happy that he was dead. And they said he was a terrorist and he deserved to die. Mm -hmm. And it was seeing that kind of response and that people, who, and these were not political students at all that I was debating with. None of them were studying politics or interested in politics. They just simply believed what the government was telling them. And from then on, I suppose my political consciousness started to develop. Tell us about your secret mission of bombing three police stations, which led you to being in prison, facing a 25-year sentence. Yes, I left South Africa in 1981, uh, joined the ANC and MK, and after a period of training, came back to South Africa as a member of a unit that is called the Special Operations Unit. Um, I was based in Lesotho, and I was working on my own. When it came to the selection of what targets I was going to um, select inside South Africa. It was pretty much left up to me, but one of the things I had discussed with my commander 
was that uh, I wanted to see whether I was able to use the fact that I was a white woman to get into places that would not be very easy for a black person to access. One of those places obviously being police stations. The first bombing was at Cambridge Police Station in East London. That was one target that I didn't choose, it was chosen for me. And the briefing I got was that it was sort of the regional headquarters of the security police in Eastern Cape at the time. And a number of MK units who had operated from Lesotho had been brutally tortured there. And I was particularly asked to, to target Cambridge Police Station. So the legend I used at all the police stations was simply to go into the charge office and say that I was applying for a gun license and then asked to be escorted or shown to, to where the ladies' rooms were. Um, in Cambridge Police Station, the public toilets were actually not working, so I was taken right through the entire police station, through the central radio room, control room, um, to um, a set of toilets where I managed to place the, the limpet mine, and then was able to leave without having to, to come back to the charge office at all, just because of the way the police station was constructed. I could just simply leave through a back gate. It was a, a little bit more challenging at John Forster Square, which was again the headquarters of the security police. Um, there I was actually stopped at the gate by a black policeman who was guarding, and he wanted to search my bag. And obviously, if he did that, it was going to be all over. So I noticed that he's, he had a white colleague who was reading a newspaper inside the guardhouse. So I made enough noise objecting so that his white colleague could hear. And when he saw what was going on, he came out and stopped his black mm -hmm. colleague and said, no, what are you doing? You can't search a white woman, just let her go. And um, yeah, so there too I was able to get into a, uh, a toilet. I didn't realize afterwards, but it was actually a men's toilet, but it was deserted. It was, I think, on the first or second floor, I can't quite recall now, and was again able to, to place the, the limpets there and leave in good time. And a similar situation at Hillbrow Police Station here, uh, a bit closer to where we are now. Um, and yeah, I had received the training about how to handle the limpet mines and everything. Um, and I heard the news later, obviously, that the um, there had been a blast at John Forster Square. I didn't pick up on the news that the limpet mine at Hillbrow had not exploded. I thought I just missed it, you know, because I was listening to radio news. And it was only after my arrest that I realized that the uh, limpet there had actually not gone off and was still there when I was arrested. Yeah. And tell us about the challenges you faced when putting this book together, as it can be traumatizing having to reflect on your painful past experiences. Yes, a, a joyful and a painful past, you're right. Um, one of the first people who encouraged me to write the book were, um, was the playwright Lucille Gilwald. She used to visit me in prison and she actually thought that the book should be entitled Pandora's Box <laughs> because she said that <laughs> it was going to be, um, you know, both joy and pain that I was going to experience in writing the book. Much of the book was written a long time ago, but you know, life tends to get in the way of things. And um, I suppose due to my political involvement in the ANC just seemed a much bigger priority. There was always something more important than actually getting the book done. And it was only a couple of years ago that I sort of finally gave myself some deadlines. I had agreed with Bulalani Nguka, who I had worked with at the prosecuting authority and the Scorpions to get his book done so I, had, I felt I had to do that one first which was published I think, about a year or two ago and then after that it was really just an editing job. Um, I was very fortunate I had a good editor. I suppose the biggest challenge was and it was the editor who brought it home to me. She kept on saying you're writing about everybody else but where are you? Where's Marion? <laughs> And I suppose that was a challenge for me. I'm not someone who does a lot of introspection and likes to think through what I'm feeling and thinking at any point in time. Um, and she just had to keep on challenging me, even though I, I did resist at times. She would keep on saying, yes, but what were you thinking then? Or how did you feel then? And obviously there were times when you, I have to use, my response was, 
it was too long ago to remember what I was thinking and quite frankly a lot of the times there wasn't time for thinking or feeling. You had a set um, path that you had, you know, actions that you had and you just, you just went through it, you just did it. You write that ordinary soldiers have been largely neglected in writing the history of Umkondo Esizu. Why do you think this is the case? I think generally what tends to happen when history is written, it tends to focus on the big men and women. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously there are a number of MK cadres who have written um, their accounts and told their stories. It was a real privilege for me to meet the men and women that I did meet in exile. And for example, in the camps, most of the cadres that I met there were of the 76th generation, so they were sort of my more or less my age, and um, yeah, I'm not sure that I think government, the Department of Military Veterans has made an effort to, to assist a lot of people in getting their books written, but um, as I said, I mean, you know, many MKKers today, or former MKKers, find themselves in very difficult positions so where they're struggling to, to, you know, to put food on the table, and I suppose trying to have the resources to sit down and actually write a book and get it published mm -hmm. is, is not easy in South Africa, it's getting easier. Mm -hmm. But um, I believe that is still, that it's one of the reasons why when I wrote the book I was determined to incorporate the stories of as many other cadres that I had either come to know or heard about in the story as well. Do you think South Africa's 30 years on since 1994 have begun to establish a society based on democratic values, social justice and fundamental human rights? Yes, I think so. Um, I think the mere fact that we have a constitution um, and a democracy that is still solid today, yes it does get shaken at times and we certainly haven't achieved what we set out to achieve just in terms of improving the quality of life for all South Africans. But I think the fact that we are a constitutional democracy and that that constitutional democracy is solid and has stood the test of time. Even these latest elections, I think we all used to ask ourselves what will happen the day the ANC loses power. Is the sky going to fall? <laughs> Um, and I think lots of people did think you were just going to see civil war break out <coughs> and violence and mm -hmm. and we have had none of that. I mean, had a peaceful transition to a government of national unity. So whilst there is much that remains to be achieved, yes, I think we have, the groundwork is in place. Yes. Talking about the new government that was formed by Ramaphosa, are you optimistic about the government of national unity? I am, yes. I'm aware that it's going to be a big challenge. I have a lot of confidence in our president's leadership abilities, particularly as someone who was there when the constitution and even you know, when the transition to democracy was being negotiated. Negotiation, I think, is, is one of his strongest skills. And whilst he has been criticised, at times I think unfairly, for being too consultative and too slow to reach decisions, <laughs> I think that's precisely the kind of leadership that is going to be required to keep this government together. So I'm anticipating that there will be you know, hiccups along the way. But if we look at how things have gone so far, I'm optimistic. And in a way, I always <coughs> said that it's probably a blessing in disguise, because mm -hmm. I think if, we, if it's properly handled, it could probably bring in a new kind of politics in South Africa. Not the politics where you know people are just literally hurling insults at one another across the parliamentary floor, <laughs> but in fact really working together to improve the lives of all. And lastly, Marion, what are you hoping to achieve with this book? Well, I first wanted to, to write it all down, to get it done, for the sake of both of my daughters, so that obviously I have told them uh, a lot about my past and what happened. Mm -hmm. But I did want there to be a record of it. But also, I took a decision when I was arrested and went on trial. Um, the position I took was that I was not going to try and plead for mercy or mitigating mm -hmm. circumstances or anything. I felt that as a white South African and as a woman, I owed it to the country to explain the decision I'd taken and why I did what I did. 
but you can only do so much in the confines of a courtroom and I felt that the fuller story needed to be told and I'm I'm hoping that more and more stories get told there are many books that have been written some of them are very critical of the ANC people who didn't have very good experiences in MK or in exile but there are also still many loyal if I can say MK cadres <laughs> and leaders who have written and I can I only hope that that trend actually continues yeah That was Marion Sparks speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about guilty and proud.